There is currently a lot of talk about invoking Article 16 of the Northern Ireland Protocol and a counter threat by the European Union to withdraw from the Trade and Cooperation Agreement. So there's quite a lot being said about this. And so being the boring old fart that I am, I actually thought I'd look it up and look at the actual provisions and do a short video to explain what they mean. Now I should first caveat, this is not legal advice, so no one should make any particular decisions or whatever based on what I've just said, I'm just some random guy on the internet, uh, albeit one that actually does understand how to apply international treaties and laws and negotiations and things, that is stuff I have done. So this is a technical discussion. This is not a political discussion. It's also not a legal discussion, so anyone wanting to do that should speak to a proper um, you know, international lawyer. But I thought it'd be interesting, and if you want to argue with your friends about what the provisions actually say, then maybe this will be of interest to you. Incidentally, I will also post links to the treaties discussed and a little bit of guidance in the video description below, so if you are a boring old fart like me, you can go and look them up for yourself. So let's start with the basics. Article 16 of Northern Ireland Protocol. What does it actually say and what does this mean? So, to cut a long story short, there's an excerpt, the first half of paragraph one of Article 16. And this says that if the application of the protocol leads to serious economic, societal or economic or environmental difficulties that are liable to persist or to diversion of trade. Now, this is an interesting thing. There's quite a bit of ambiguity here because what we don't have is a definition of what is a serious economic, societal, environmental uh, difficulty. Now, you could argue that perhaps, for example, if Northern Ireland breaks out into civil war and massive social unrest, that would qualify. And that would qualify for uh, this article to be invoked um, in, as a response of that. But also it has a liable to persist provision in there. So that means this must be something that you think will continue not necessarily a short term thing. So, you know, firebombing a bus, for example, does not qualify. That's a short term thing at this stage. Don't hold me to that. Um, it does also allow either of the parties to unilaterally take action as a safeguard measure. So that is what Article 16 does say. And there's room for interpretation here. That there always is. Let's look at the second half of that paragraph which is actually a restriction. In the second half of the paragraph said that this safeguard measure should be restricted with regard to the scope and duration, to what is strictly necessary in order to remedy the situation. And the priority must also be given that the measures will do the least disturbance to the functioning of the protocol. So what does that mean? If there's a specific rule, specific regulation that is creating that serious economic, societal, environmental problem, then you can make a specific derogation um, to that rule to, at the at part of the safeguard measure. You can do so unilaterally. However, you cannot make it a widespread provision. So strictly speaking, when people say you cannot just suspend the whole protocol, they are correct. This safeguard says that the scope is restricted to whatever is causing the exact problem. You cannot just decide to get rid of the whole uh, protocol. And also, you need to restrict the duration. It cannot be a permanent suspension. It has to be a temporary one until the serious problem, whatever they may be, have eased. And you need to do so in a way to, allow, to cause minimum disruption to the protocol. That is what this provision explicitly says, and that's that's quite clear. So you can't really suspend the whole protocol um, using Article 16. 
because um, it could be argued to be in breach. You're, you're, you're going too wide. You also, I think, have to provide a certain level of evidence as to what exactly the harm is that you're trying to prevent or deal with. And of course, we all know the UK government has not provided this particular evidence. Um, it, some people may speculate that this is because uh, they don't have the evidence. I cannot say one way or the other. What I can say is they have not provided the evidence. That could be one reason. They don't want it to be scrutinised. Another reason is it's very well known in legal terms that you don't divulge anything that you don't have to because this may be used against you. That, that word it may be sound familiar, those who watch uh, cop shows and so on. Uh, any evidence you provide may be taken down and used against you. So the UK government may well not be providing evidence in order for it not to be used against it. Because don't forget, this Northern Ireland Protocol is not only an international treaty, it's also UK national law. So any evidence that the UK government provides to justify invoking this article can be challenged not only in international courts but also in UK national courts. So by withholding that, and it's a standard tactic, you know, in, in legal terms, you don't provide that evidence um, because it allows you, you certain flexibility, allows you not to impugn your position, whatever the phrase may be. So, so while people may say it is because the government uh, doesn't have the evidence, that is possibly true. But it's also possibly true that they don't want to hand ammunition to people who want to challenge or to stop them. So what else do we have under Article 16? Well, we have a second paragraph. And that second paragraph says that if a safeguard measure is invoked, it can be countered by the other side. So if the UK government invokes Article 16, suspends the protocol or bits of the protocol, then the EU may take rebalancing measures to counter that suspension. That is contained here in this Article 16 as well. So they can retaliate effectively. Uh, the bounds of the treaty allows them to do that. And the purpose of that retaliation is to remedy the imbalance. So I suppose, for example, if they suspended all the checks so that, just a theoretical example, meats of inferior quality could be you know, imported from the Great Britain mainland to Northern Ireland, then the EU would be allowed to you know, not allow any meat from Great Britain into the, uh, into the market you know, for the purpose of rebalancing that thing. You know, that that uh, that measure. So they can counter. There's a little bit more than just this, though. Now people have mentioned that there is a consultation aspect to Article 16, and this is referenced in Annex 7. So there is an obligation that prior to invoking Article 16, you must notify the other party, and you must do so at least a month. In advance and you must also so immediately enter into consultation with the joint committee and that's referenced explicitly here <coughs> so there's a joint committee set up by the trade and cooperation agreement or the withdrawal agreement and so the UK must notify the EU if it wishes to trigger article 16 it must then enter in consultation with this joint committee with a view to trying to find some kind of acceptable solution. So at this point, I have no notification and no knowledge of whether the UK government has done this. Now, it has to be said that lawyers being the picky bunch that they are, if you don't follow this procedure, you start to harm your case. So we've already talked about the lack of evidence currently available to support any argument for you know, Article 16, although Lord Frost has claimed that the criteria has been met. Um, but also, even if that is correct, 
Lord Frost has to follow the consultation procedure, otherwise that would be deemed as harmful to his defence, um, because of course you've got to do it the appropriate way. So, the third paragraph of Article 7 says at least a month must elapse prior to actually suspending measures, really, before the expiration of the state limit. Now, for the lawyers among you, there's an interesting phrase here that always gets uh, lawyers a bit twitchy. And that phrase is towards the bottom. And it starts with, when exceptional circumstances require immediate action. Now, exceptional circumstances, another one of those difficult, undefined terms. We don't know what serious economic, societal or environmental you know, difficulties may be that could be subject to interpretation. Equally, don't, we don't know what exceptional circumstances are. You know, where can that be required? Obviously, if you have a scenario like you know, massive unrest and civil war breaking out in Northern Ireland, then yes, that is very clear that that is exceptional circumstances and either side would be fully entitled to unilaterally and immediately suspend um, elements of the Northern Ireland Protocol in order to alleviate that problem. But in the absence of such a very obvious issue, you can't really invoke this. And I think if Lord Frost does try to invoke Article 16 to apply with immediate effect, he's going to have to justify exceptional circumstances. And that most certainly will be a higher bar than just normal, you know, ex uh, difficulties, whatever they may be. So we need to be careful doing that. Um, because all of this, this is a treaty. So this can be judged um, under international law. It can be taken to an international court for arbitration. And they will look at these provisions and they will look at the, how the both sides have behaved in implementing the provisions and all of that will be taken into consideration. So whatever is done, and there's lots of phrasing to that effect across the whole of the Article 16 provision, it must be strictly necessary. So anything that's done must be justified. Now there's a completely different angle because of course the EU can retaliate by doing remedial measures. That's one thing the EU can do. But the EU does actually threaten to pull out of the trade and cooperation agreement entirely, which is a very significant, serious threat. That effectively amounts to a no deal Brexit. So all the supply shortages problems, the inability to move goods across the borders um, would obviously get far worse in that sort of scenario. So does the EU have sufficient ground to back up that threat? Well, to answer that question, you need to go to the Vienna Convention on the Laws of Treaties. And I've posted a link to this. Anyone can look, up this, for the, look this up for themselves. But there's two particular articles of that convention that I think the EU might use in its defence. You know, they, could, they could suspend the agreement. And the UK could then try to take the EU to court for you know, unilaterally suspending the agreement. So, two article that the EU could use to justify that. One is fraud. Uh, and that article says that if a state has been induced to conclude a treaty by a fraudulent conduct of another negotiating state, and that the state may invoke this fraud invalidating its uh, consent. Because what you've got to remember about all treaties, all the principal treaties, they're all based on the principle that the states have consented to be legally bound by those treaties. So the EU might argue that the Dominic Cummings revelation might justify this, this article, this Article 49, because Dominic Cummings has alleged that Boris Johnson had no intention of honouring the Northern Ireland Protocol. And thus, Boris Johnson and Lord Frost, 
if those claims are true, negotiated not in good faith with the EU. And if they did that, then they obtained the EU's consent by fraudulent means. That's the argument goes. I don't know what the bar is for justifying this article. This has not exactly been tested. Nation states don't tend to use this on each other. They usually try to be trustworthy. I shan't say any more on that topic. Instead, I should look at Article 60, which is another article provision that the EU might be interested in. And this is where the termination or suspension of the operation of a treaty as a consequence of its breach. So this is where a material breach of a bilateral treaty by one of the parties entitles the other to invoke this breach as a ground for termination. So if the UK invokes Article 16, suspends the entirety of the Northern Ireland Protocol, and the EU argues very strongly that that is not what that article can do, and that therefore the actions of the UK are in serious breach of the whole trade and cooperation agreement, then the EU may indeed invoke this article to justify the complete suspension or termination of the entire trade and cooperation agreement. Not just the Northern Ireland Protocol, the entire agreement. So in a very long-winded way, uh, I suppose looking at all these specific provisions, these are the options, as I see it, available both to the UK and to the EU. Now, as I said earlier, I'm not providing any kind of legal advice here. I'm not saying whether either side has a particularly strong case or not for any of these provisions. However, this is all worth bearing in mind when listening to the current political arguments going on about whether Article 16 can be invoked or not, and the potential serious cons consequences that may result from that. So I hope uh, if you're boring anorak wearing treaty reader like me, you enjoyed this uh, and that this is helpful.